of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. The Lord be with you. Holy and gracious God, we've heard a strange reading, one that doesn't seem to make sense. So we're asking you, O God, to stir our hearts up to hear what you are saying to us today and to help our lives reflect that and how we trust you and how we live in your creation. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. What's it mean to have something that is urgent in our lives? I'm not sure we think about that word urgent very much. Maybe you've got an urgent text or an urgent phone call. Most of us today, we see who's calling and then decide whether we'll answer or not. They can always leave a message. Or we'll get a text and maybe not reply quickly. We don't have a strong sense of urgency about much. I, I think, though, there is one place that we all can understand a sense of urgency, and it's almost unspeakable. When you have to go to the restroom. In those moments, it's urgent. If you do not respond, if you do not react, if you don't do something, there's going to be a problem. So I think we can understand urgency. But do we understand urgency in relation to God? We have just heard a strange reading from the Gospel of Luke. Now, here's a little bit of history on it. Only Luke has this parable. He's the lone guy that has it. And in, even in the really, really, really old lectionary, meaning the order that we read Scripture in the life of the church, this parable always has been in there. So the church has valued it, even though it's a strange one. I mean, just look at the premise. Here's a guy, he's a wealthy man, and he, meaning he's a landowner most likely, and he's got a hired hand, a manager, a steward, that he's entrusted with his stuff to take care of his business. And he hears rumor that this guy has not been doing right by him. And so he calls him in and says, I've heard this about you. Give me an accounting. I want to see the books because you're not going to be in this position any longer. And then we hear the weirdness start. The manager starts going, what am I going to do? I mean, it's a conversation in his head. Oh, my. I'm, I'm, look at me. I can't take and go out and dig ditches anymore. I'm past that point. Uh, I, I'm not going to beg because I'm, I'm above that. I can't do that. Oh, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. I've still got the position for the moment. I've got to get the books. I can have to. And we hear him then cutting down the amount that people owe. I'm sure those people were happy. An authority of the landowner was reducing the amount they owed. Now, we might want to go, so is Jesus suggesting to us to be dishonest? Is that what Jesus is saying? Is Jesus encouraging us to be dishonest? Is this meant to be like, be like this guy? Not in financial management or working for our boss. What Jesus is lifting up to us is urgency. Urgency of the kingdom of God. Remember Luke. Luke is now, we don't know the actual name of the author of Luke. We call it Luke because it's, uh, it's what the name is and who it's going to. So we've got Luke, and he has collected every scrap of information that he can about Jesus Christ. He has collected all of the stories, he has collected everything he can to write down this testimony. To who Jesus is, the gospel, also the book of Acts then. So he's gathered all of this information and he includes this parable. 
to lift up the urgency. You see, Luke clearly understands the kingdom of God has come near. The kingdom of God is at hand. So what? You see, even in the early church, there was an issue around wealth and stuff. The earliest Christians were struggling with, how do we live the Christian life following Jesus in this real world? We have the haves and the have-nots. We've got those who have big wages and those who have little wages. We've got those who cheat one another. How are we supposed to live following Jesus? What do we do with all that? Well, certainly after 2,000 years, we have the answer, right? After 2,000 years, we should have this down and pat. Do we? You know, I wish that I had had the wisdom to invest money in the storage unit business. I don't remember there being storage units when I was a kid. Now, they're everywhere. And... American people have maybe one, but it doesn't take long before they're growing to two to three storage units, renting somebody else's property because our houses can't hold all our stuff. Have we figured out how to live with all of this? We do the same thing with money. We hoard and we hide and we say we don't have anything do we have our sense of how we live as followers of Jesus years back I had a neighbor he lived to a really old age he was a nice man to me he would bring over a tomato every now and then like a two-pound tomato that he grew and boy were they good well I also knew he had one child, an adult daughter, and I had gotten to know her. Her life had really, really been hard. She married young, and as is the story of many who've, who've married young, sometimes those marriages aren't so great. In this particular marriage, she had married an abuser, a beater. You know, this type of guy that thinks it's okay to hit a woman. She had a child, and finally she had the inner strength to get out. But getting out for her meant a life of pure struggle, of pure challenge. So I knew her history. I knew that she lived in a tiny little house now, and she worked really hard. Well, her dad died. And I'm meeting with her, and we're talking about the plans for the funeral, but also what's going to happen next for her. And she's angry. Her dad had a lot of money. You'd never have guessed it if you looked at him, but he had a lot of money. Her mother had died many, many, many years before. And so she was angry, and she says, I don't want his stuff. I don't want his money now. When I really needed help, he said no. He wouldn't help. Do we Christians, followers of Jesus, have this figured out? He was saving his money for that rainy day and to someday give an inheritance to his daughter but in the living of his days missed out on the desperate need that she had and didn't help. I think that this parable is meant to stir up our hearts and minds. I believe that this parable is meant to jar us to figure out there is urgency in responding to what God has done for us and its urgency in the living of every part of our life. I don't believe our Lord is saying, yay, go be a bad person and do bad things at work. But rather, these people are shrewd enough to know how to survive. Oh, if the children of light, 
would be that shrewd in responding to the urgency of the gospel, the urgency of Christ's love for us, and allowing that to reshape our every moment in the living of our days. You see, that's where the rubber hits the road. That's where Christ is calling us urgently, respond to the love that's been given to us, and that is rooted in trusting God more than we trust ourselves, more than we trust our possessions, more than we trust our bank accounts, daring to trust God with all that we are. Now there's a passage that I think is helpful for us this morning, coming from 1 John, 1 John 3, he, where it reads, we know love by this, that he, Jesus, laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need? and yet refuses to help. Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him. The scripture story is pretty clear. The parable calls us to urgency. The scripture calls us to faith and love. How are we living this out? You see, we come in here, we come before God to offer praise and thanksgiving. We hear the reading of the word and, and a sermon. We receive the gracious gift of the sacrament, and then we go back out into the world. How are we living God's grace that goes with us there. Amen.